providing the education that is required. Senator Patrick. The genius of Ronald Reagan, and I don't pretend to be, and I don't think anyone else pretends to be Ronald Reagan, but the genius was he changed the way people thought about things. We need a lieutenant governor who does a strong arm on every bill where he needs a vote, but he begins the process, and one needed, does, but he begins to change the way people think. The rural Republicans, true, many of them are not supportive, but they were coming on board this session. Some of the superintendents aren't, but they were coming on board this session. Our inner city African-American Democrats are not quite there, but they did support our charter bill. People said, Dan, you're not going to pass a charter bill this session. We passed it 30 to 1. In fact, there's only one Republican to vote against it. The Democrats came on board. We, we passed, and look, when we worked together well, I'll admit it, we passed the recovery school district. Royce West, a Democrat, as chairman, I took the bill to him, and that would place any failing school in a state district until that district turned around. We have to change the way people think about these key issues, and we have to think bigger of our districts. We have to think about the entire state of Texas. I Trust me, folks, I will pass your choice. You know, we have to be able to lead, to motivate, to inspire, and to sell. The folks who oppose school choice, the rural districts, whatever they may be and whatever their reason, they do so out of fear, fear of competition. They fear that they will not be able to compete. I go back to what I said earlier in my initial answer. We have a provision in the education code called home rule districts. But you can't implement it because it's too cumbersome, the standards of vote are too high. If we do that and we give assurance in doing so, eliminate the fear. You lead, you inspire, you motivate yourself. You eliminate that fear and say, look, your local district can compete. School choice is a wonderful idea. Competition always drives improvement, but we've got school districts that can't compete because they're under a system that's not competitive, which is the reason we want school choice. So, we have to sell to those folks who are not yet with us. I'm a guy who has a history of doing things like that, and that's what I will do. The reason that it hasn't passed is because Texas voters have not made that a priority in meeting with their state representatives and their state senators. And when Texas voters get serious about an issue, things happen in Austin. Your voice does count, and it does matter. My philosophy is you need a lieutenant governor that is going out meeting with the state senators, talking about these issues, defining what our priorities happen to be, and hearing directly from you. I do a lot of economic development work as commissioner of agriculture. I meet with businesses that want to relocate to Texas. It doesn't matter what the industry happens to be. They have a question mark on their site selection committee paperwork, and the question mark is, what is Texas going to do to have a skilled, educated, and trained workforce? We need to make education our number one priority, recognizing that getting parents involved will make a difference in the outcome of our children, and that power really rests with you as you talk with your elected officials at home. Some of the frustration that, that all voters, I think, are feeling right now is that Washington's broke, people aren't listening, that sort of thing. Sometimes you feel like the, 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 the cards are stacked against you. Right now we have bureaucrats, politicians, and wealthy university officials that use millions of dollars of taxpayers' money every year to come lobby you guys in Austin. They come on the taxpayer's dime, whining and dining our elected officials to get them to give more money to their various entities while the taxpayers back home can't get off work and don't have the money to come lobby. So that's my concern. Will you support legislation to prevent taxpayer funds from being used to lobby the legislature? And if so, what specific actions will you take as Lieutenant Governor? Yes, yes, and yes, all right? There's another bill that I have filed in the last couple of years that ties into this. And that is, I've tried and I've filed it and I can't get it out of committee. I believe that when you leave the legislature, you should be banned from doing any lobby work for a minimum of four years, which is two seconds. I will find a chairman of that committee who makes a promise that he will consider that legislation seriously. We will have a committee 
I will urge them to pass that bill and bring it to the floor. I've never understood why legislators are against that bill because the very few legislators in the big scheme of things go into lobbying. If you're out of the legislature, you should not be able to go from a committee chair or a committee right into lobbying the same people that you were working with before. One of the greatest examples and many of you, again, who have listened to the radio station over the years, knows the name Fred Hill, who blocked any efforts to reduce property taxes because the counties and cities didn't want it. And when he left the legislature, he went right into lobbying for those groups. That must end. Legislators should, when they run, I guarantee you something, when they come and knock on your door, hello, I'm running for the state house, for the state senate, and by the way, if you elect me, when I'm done, I'm going to be a lobbyist. You've never elected. I want to make this an issue. That needs to change in Texas. And yes, we should not use public funds to, to lobby the government. You know, you know, I'm one of those that left the Senate and lobbied for four years before I was elected land commissioner. I lobbied for the Second Amendment. I lobbied for a lot of liberty causes. And yes, I was compensated, not a lot. We have to be very careful when we start, you know, I'm kind of a libertarian guy. When we start interfering with the free speech ability and work ability of certain people. So the question is, is all of it bad or all of it good? I don't know, but uh, I lobbied for the Second Amendment and got some really good things done in that four years I was out. Uh, the other thing I would like to think, we, we worry about the lobby, we talk about the lobby, we worry about the lobby is a terrible thing. But the lobby, essentially, one of my methods of finding out, learning about an issue was when there was an issue before me, I got the lobbyists on both sides to give me their best shot. So the lobby performs a function. They are not the evil, evil, uh, you, know, uh, you know, third world or the fifth estate that you think they are. And frankly, uh, I support the elimination of tax dollars being used for lobbying. The best lobbyist from a government entity is the mayor, maybe a member of the council, the commissioner's court, the county judge. They don't need to hire lobbyists. But I'm very, very careful <coughs> being a libertarian guy and the First Amendment proponent that I am to tell people they can't do certain things when they leave that is a free speech and a freedom of association and employment. That should not be done to tell them they can't do it. We should tell the taxing entities they can't spend their tax dollars to pay somebody to do that. That I'm okay with. And to be clear, that's the question. Is can they use taxpayer, should taxpayer funds be allowed to be used in, in lobbying? That's, that's the question. And your taxpayer dollars shouldn't be used to work against you on issues that you don't agree with. I mean, that's just really the reality of what we're talking about here. And what we need to make certain and to avoid that happening is have a transparent process so where you see those dollars are going and entities are required to spend to show how their dollars are being spent. And, and that is the best way to accomplish that uh, uh, because if we pass a bill, and I'm for it, so they can't go hire outside lobbyists to lobby against you, people are creative. They think of different ways to use money and how to do things. And so we need to have a transparent process on how those dollars are being spent, and you can see how your elected officials are doing that. You know who the best lobbyist is? Those of you that are sitting in this room. I can't tell you how much of an impact it is when you take the time to come to Austin, to come into your representative's office or your senator's office and to talk about issues that you're passionate about. Nobody gets smarter because they go to Austin or Washington. That's pretty evident in our world we live in. But you being involved, getting your neighbors to come in, getting members of your church to come down, really can make a difference in the process of government and getting issues passed that you believe in. And we need more people participating in that. We need our high school groups coming down, taking a day out, and coming to the Capitol to see how that process works. That's the way that we're going to reform our system. In, in education today, we talked a little bit about tonight, we have college readiness and career readiness. We need to add another C, citizenship readiness, and teach people how to be a part of this process. Governor Dewhurst. I agree with what my three friends have said. 
I see mayors from time to time when they come in. I think I've got a responsibility to sit down, and there's several in the room. I see county judges. I see county commissioners. I listen to them, but I don't see taxpayer-funded lobbyists. They don't come to me. I don't. I don't think it's proper. Um, and I am in favor of banning legislators to have an open door policy. They're here one day and they're lobbying the next. That bothers me. I've seen firsthand over the uh, last several years the tsunami effect of our four public education lobby groups, our, our four unions. Our four unions have lobby groups. And if I had to sum up in three words their attitude, just say no. Uh, as we're trying to improve public education, as we're trying to create more opportunities, as we're trying to bring in the 21st century into public education, they just say no. It's the most frustrating experience. Uh, you've experienced the same thing. Uh, but they've got a special interest. We've got to get away from special interest. You're our special interest, ladies and gentlemen. We work for you. And that's why I learned more by citizen groups, and I want to pick up on what Todd said. Um, I learn more from citizen groups and Tea Party and grassroots groups coming in and telling me what you think than I do from lobbyists. So please, um, I know my door is open. I'm sure my colleagues' doors are open. Come see us. Tell us what you think. And let's together make this state even greater. Okay, all four of you guys are so good at this that on every question so far, you've succinctly answered it well in the first minute. So on the fly, we're going to go down to one minute in these last uh, about of time we have so we can get in more questions. Okay, guys? And you can use your rebuttal if you'd like to add, too, because everybody's still got plenty of rebuttals left, and we're running out of time, so we want to get some good questions. This one is from our group here, Texas is first in many categories. One of those is in exiling citizens when they reach retirement age. According to the last census, Texas is near the bottom in retention of citizens 65 and older, due largely to the state property tax, which is near the top. The tax also discriminates against the handicapped, the elderly, and those who try to stretch their investment by building their own homes. The current tax structure, in many ways, rewards those who should be penalized, deteriorating houses, and penalizes those who should be rewarded, such as maintaining their property and increasing the value of their home. These shortfalls have been known for decades, yet there's been no significant improvements despite claims to the contrary. What alternatives to the property tax system would you support? And I believe we're back to Commissioner Patterson first. I think, okay. We need to look at a value-added tax, a credit model value-added tax. What was introduced last session? If we did that, we could eliminate all ad valorem taxes, all sales taxes, all occupation taxes, uh, we could do that with a VAT of about 9%. Now, that would be on goods and services. So this would be very controversial. It would be very difficult to pass. But I, you know, we have a property-based, or property ad valorem tax system. It is not fair. It hurts jobs and the economy. It is heavy on the capital intense industry. Those people that pay good jobs and good wages, it's not working. Good news is we don't have an income tax. Bad news is we have oppressive property taxes and we need it looking at their total elimination, not just reduction. What I've heard about a value added tax, I am totally opposed to because it adds a tax on every phase of the process of production of an item. And so what I heard about that is not the direction I think we need to go as a study. I think what we need to look at is to lower our property tax and use the sales tax in order to do that. We ought to, first of all, dedicate excess revenues to lowering your property tax that come about from a robust economy in Texas that is creating jobs and creating opportunity. That's our first mission, what we ought to do, before we look at raising anything else. But if we can move away from property taxes, sales tax, but I'll tell you this, I do not want to trade a property tax for a transfer tax on real estate. Why take it out of one pocket and then just get it out of the other pocket? That is not the right approach. So we need to be, uh, I, I want to make certain we get rid of the margins tax. That would be a great thing of what we do to come into Texas all together. And we can do that by making these our priorities. We've got a rebuttal card for Commissioner Patterson. Well, I think it's more of a clarification call, 
Clark, Todd, you need to understand the different types of value added taxes, VAT tax. There's a credit model, which is what I talk about, which would be at each level of the transaction in the conveyance of the tracks of the tax, it would be credited back, so you would get credit. Essentially, only the final sale has the cumulative tax placed on it. So it's, it's different than what you were describing, which if what you were describing was uh, what, what I was talking about, I might be opposed to it as well. Credit model value and tax. Credit model value and tax. All right, uh, Governor Dewhurst. I'm not in favor either of the um, of the value added tax. I have tried to look over the last two years at models of how we can reduce our property taxes. I've worked with the Texas Public Policy Foundation in modeling. Uh, how we would have to structure an increase in sales tax to offset the property taxes. My concern so far has been that sales tax number has gotten higher than I wanted to see uh, us have. At the same time, we have a margin tax that I've hated from day one and briefed the senators this is the most un-American tax I've ever seen in my life. You can be losing money and still have to pay a tax, and that's not right. So, one of our interim charges is going to be going uh, during the interim and going and, and looking at restructuring our tax code, sales tax, to come up with a fair approach and alternative to the market tax. Senator Patrick. This year, I was honored to get Empower Texas endorsement for my fiscal responsibility as a senator. And here's an idea you haven't heard from these other three. The way we reduce property taxes is reduce our state budget and reduce spending in the state of Texas. We spend too much money. Here's how you do it. Right now, the property tax is based on evaluation without representation. Yeah. Got that right. We need to structure a property tax that has a circuit breaker. We need to lower the effective tax rate. So as your values go up, your rates go down. We cannot let our cities and counties get a 7, 8, and 9 percent increase in their budget every year and tell you they haven't raised their taxes. That's right. Because they have that value. What we must do is make our local officials come to you and make their case, whether they're a superintendent, a mayor, or a county judge, of why they want to raise your tax rate, and then you make the decision. Right now, the decision is being made by the appraisal board, and that's why I'm going to reduce your property taxes. We're going to lower the effective tax rate. Okay, I'm not running for anything, but I don't want to break my promise. It's 5 nothing Red Sox over the Cardinals in the top of the six. I told you I'd have an and I just need to do that. Okay. So, uh, look, there used to be a great congressman from this area by the name of Tom DeLay. He was taken out not by the voters, but by a corrupt prosecutor in Travis County. Travis County is the most liberal county in the state, and yet our Republican legislature empowers that prosecutor with incredible power to investigate public service from around the state. We've had the opportunity to take that away from them and give it over to the Attorney General, who is elected by the entire state, and the legislature has refused to do that. Fortunately, Governor Perry had the courage after the DA there was shown on video with that horrible spitting and cursing arrest against the, the police officers, embarrassed enough. Governor Perry defunded that public integrity unit, but they still have the statutory power, and I'm assuming the funds will probably go right back in next time. The question is, as Lieutenant Governor, will you refuse to give this power back to the Travis DA and move the public integrity unit to the Attorney General, who's elected by all Texans, not just the liberals in Travis County? Commissioner Staples is up first this time. Well, I think about some great Lieutenant Governor, uh, Attorney Generals we've had in Texas, but I also think about Dan Morales, who served federal prison time for corruption. And so what we absolutely need to take away from the Travis County DA, there's just no doubt about that. It's unrealistic to think the most liberal county in Texas should be the empowered to enforce our ethics laws and our ethics rules. What we need to look at, though, is a separate panel, I believe, of unelected officials that are appointed and that are, that are reviewed by the legislature. We can make changes to that. 
by simply giving to the Attorney General, if we get a bad Attorney General in there, like we had with Dan Morales that it served time, I think it is a very uh, dangerous situation. So we need to look at something different than that. When I was in the Senate, and we looked at where we needed to have courts for those who, um, and trials. Oh, that's just Would you like to use, you can use a rebuttal card if you like. Oh, phone two for this one. Okay. <laughs> can I use half a rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can come back to it on the next one. Okay, I think, uh, let's see. It's <laughs> okay, Governor Dewhurst next. <laughs> You really didn't want to use that rebuttal card, did you? That's like gold over there. <laughs> Rick, um, in Travis County, I thought a, a number of times, I'm not going to break state law, but if I ever went out and started telling the DPS to not enforce this law or that law, like Barack Obama is telling the Department of Justice to not enforce immigration laws and drug laws, and, uh, and, uh, and he's picking winners and losers, uh, the Travis County DA would have me in a grand jury and indicted uh, in just about that fast. So this, we need a system in which is fair. Uh, Ronnie Earl was the most, one of the most partisan people that we've ever had. And uh, quite frankly, uh, Todd, I've thought about some sort of a panel. We've got to have staff that, that would look into this. You need an impartial a group that would look into public uh, integrity, and uh, I'd be willing to uh, move legislation to that extent. So let me verify with both of you guys, though. So you're not for putting this in the Attorney General? Who's elected by the whole state? Or no, you I'd be willing to look at that or look at a, uh, a panel approach. I think uh, uh, I understand Todd's concern. Uh, he works great with a great attorney general. We've had, uh, if. Uh, but right, I mean, anybody's corruptible, right? That's but right. but at least that person's answering everybody. Todd, yes or no on the. Oh, no. I won't make you burn a rebuttal. I'm asking you. And Dan's going to the answer. I'll get back to it then. It's not a, it's, it's not that easy. I, I moved, I set up a court here in Montgomery County or authorized courts in Montgomery County to make decisions because it was a conservative county when I was a member of the Senate because I wanted good Texans making those decisions. We need some type of a judicial process that is, that is not subject to political maneuvering by an attorney general that we, we love a few that we've had here, but we've had some madness. Okay. And most of our decisions have been. <laughs> Actually, it's Dan, Dan's up. It's uh, Senator Patrick's up. Go ahead. I'm losing control. Senator Patrick is up. Can I have a ham sandwich? Actually, I, I think the idea of, a, of an independent board is the direction to go. We need to take it out of the uh, DA's hand. And it is true. You know, if, if Greg Abbott. Uh, was the Attorney General. I believe he would be a fair and honest broker to either party where someone might be brought before him. Uh, I know of a situation where, let's just say this, the DA in Travis County was pressured by the Democrats in Travis County to go after, in my view, um, someone that maybe they would not have. Tremendous political pressure up there to make the Republicans look bad. And it really, uh, no one should be prosecuted because of their politics. If they've done something wrong that needs to be adjudicated, we need to move forward. So I think the board makes sense, and uh, I think that is the way to go. And, and, we, and we need to quit talking about this and actually do it. Yeah, good, good point. Okay, let's, let's talk style for a second. I right? haven't had an opportunity. Oh, can we skip my good we, we, we Don't I get no respect around here? I apologize. No, I'll be, I'll be brief. We absolutely, categorically, unequivocally, immediately need to move it from the Travis County DA to the Attorney General's office. And then we can later fine tune it if we need to. But immediate move to the AG office will fix it better later. Okay, let's talk. That, that actually leads me into my last couple of questions. Let's talk style, leadership style for our last 
a couple of questions. And, and uh, several of you have said that the debacle at the end of the first special session this summer, you put out immediately, I, actually I think, Governor, all three of your opponents said after it was over that Bob Bullock would not have allowed that to happen. Uh, maybe, it may only be two of the three, so I apologize if it's not two of the three. But they were very vocal about the fact that the pro-life bill died at the end of the first session because of lack of leadership on your part. I want to give you the chance to answer that and tell us if in hindsight you would have done anything differently. And I'd like to ask the other three, what specifically would you have done to save the bill instead of us having to come back and do a second special session? So, Governor, we'll let you go first. You know, I saw a quote by Joel Osteen recently that said, sometimes you face difficulties, but they're not because you're doing something wrong, it's because you're doing something right. The, for those of us who believe in protecting women's health and protecting the unborn, um, the score at the end of uh, this summer was one for saving lives and zero for Wendy Davis. And at the end of I'm personally not afraid of Wendy Davis. Greg Abbott isn't afraid of Wendy Davis. And so at the end of the day, I happen to believe in, in the importance of preserving life. And I don't run away from a fight that I believe is right. Um, let me use one more. Yes, sir. Um, there are no guarantees in life. I spoke with Governor Perry repeatedly during the days, week leading up to the first time we brought up that pro-life bill. And all he did was push me. I didn't have any assurance that he would call us right back in. And so we had a plan. All the senators agreed to it. They didn't want to give up the right to filibuster. So we went in and we broke the filibuster. Now, if I had to do it over again, I would have gone back and in the pre-meetings with the DPS, gotten ac actual numbers. Um, we knew there was going to be some protesting. We didn't anticipate 7,000, 8,000 people. But I took the word of the DPS that we were going to have enough people there. And that when I said clear the galleries, and twice I said clear the galleries, and somehow they didn't get that message. Senator Patrick. I need two minutes for this one. Here's a card. Let me tell you what happened. I was there. The Republicans met in a caucus, and, and there were many of us who wanted not to have the filibuster. But there were a number of Republicans who said, um, we'll go forward and allow her to speak for a few hours. So, as a senator, uh, you can call the previous question, move the previous question, if you have five seconds. So I was that senator, and I had five seconds. And there were others who could have done it as well. That's that moment. Let's go back a week before that. Here's the great mystery that I've never heard the Lieutenant Governor answer. Glenn Hager's bill, which was one of my bills, one of Bob Dole's bills, and his bill, mysteriously had the ban on abortion for five months taken out of it. Had we passed that bill out the week before with a ban on abortion, in five months it would have gone to the House, it wouldn't have been amended, it would have gone to the Governor, there wouldn't have been a filibuster. Now in a debate this week, the Lieutenant Governor said, yesterday I think it was, we've had three this week, he said that there were Republicans who didn't want to vote for that. It's his job to get the Republicans to vote for it. They did vote for it. Every Republican voted for it. We should have passed that out. There was no vision of what was going to happen when it came back. So now it comes back to the Senate a week later. And that morning, at 11 o'clock in the morning, and you may not realize this, Governor Perry put four bills on the call. Is that a minute and a half where I am? Or he put four bills on the call. Criminal justice, transportation, the life bill, and redistrict. We only passed one of the four. Bad management. Bad clock management. Can't orchestrate a calendar. We get down to the 30th day with 13 hours to go and three of the four bills have been passed. Had I been lieutenant governor, I would have passed the transportation bill 31 to nothing. It would have passed. I would have passed the criminal justice bill 31 to nothing. It would have passed. And I would have <coughs> adjourned. No filibuster. No filibuster. 
And Perry would have called us back a day or two later and we'd have passed it. It was just mishandled from day one, and as Lieutenant Governor, it would have never happened on my watch. Quite frankly, I don't think it would have happened on my watch of anyone sitting up here. Rebuttal card for Governor Dewhurst. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most important things, and the other two gentlemen will tell you this, is integrity and people believing in you. That's what the Senate works on. If, if they don't believe what you're saying, you're not going to be an effective lieutenant governor. Uh, in the meeting a week, roughly a week out, I spent the whole day trying to get the senators include not just ambulatory surgical centers, but moving the deadline on abortions from six months to five months, which I support and I, I feel very strongly about. That's, I'm endorsed by all the four largest pro-life organizations. I've carried all the pro-life, I've moved all the pro-life legislation. Before I was lieutenant governor, only one bill never passed, I passed nine. And that morning, they had a choice. The, it is simply not true. I couldn't get them to move on this, and so I told Elizabeth Graham, fine, put it on the house, send it right back. And that's what they did. Unfortunately, I told the, the speaker, don't send it back to us past Sunday. And he sent it back to us a day later. We got it 12 hours before. And if I had not passed the other two bills and we hadn't passed pro-life, I'll give you another card. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. If, if I hadn't, I wasn't going to pass, Dan, I wasn't going to pass those other two bills when I felt, felt like the the pro-life bill was more important and would save lives. I was more interested in saving lives and since I didn't have a commitment that if in fact we didn't get it passed, that would put more pressure on Governor Perry to call us right back. That was my thinking. That's what I would do again because we broke the filibuster at 1010. We had an hour and a half, an hour and 50 minutes to close down and finish that bill and pass the other two. And unfortunately, and it's a great organization, I'm not at all criticizing them, but we had a breakdown in, in communications when I said, clear the gallery. Somehow they didn't hear me. I think, I think most has already been said. As a member of the Senate, I had a 100% pro-life voting record. But that removing the 20-week prohibition from the bill before it left the Senate was a mistake for two reasons. Not only was it a mistake tactically, it was a mistake strategically. That was the provision in that bill that almost all of Texas agreed on. So when you start defending life, you've got to sell to those people who maybe aren't completely with you. But if you can pass a bill where everybody says, yeah, 20 weeks? Of course no abortions after that time. That was a not only a tactical, but a strategic error. And it allowed us to take the high ground. So why even bother passing the bill that took out the thing that allowed Republicans and pro-life people across Texas to take the high ground? We, to didn't, talk to we didn't take it out. Uh, we we Governor, Governor I, I, think, uh, I, think, I think I've got uh, oh. Mike now. But that was a marketing error. It was a tactical error. I would not have done that. Commissioner Stevens. Unfortunately, what happened this last session was an example of failed leadership. Everyone who watches that process knows she was going to filibuster. It was going to come to an end. And because they didn't just adjourn and start again the next day, we all are going to be suffering because Wendy Davis is an energized candidate. We're going to have liberals moving into our state, costing us down ballot seats, I believe, costing us judicial seats in Houston and in Dallas and in other areas. But it didn't just start there. During the regular session, when this bill was on the floor, the lieutenant governor went out to drinks with his political consultant while that bill was on the floor the first time. So if you hire us to do a job, I think you expect us to go do that job during the session working on those issues. Those are just real circumstances that happen. It's unfortunate, and we all are suffering because of those decisions. Okay, guys, I apologize. We're going to go 10 minutes over here so we can get our closing comments in. But before you do the closing comments, 
We definitely, after this primary, want to be united as Republicans going into November. And towards that end, since everybody's had the opportunity to uh, criticize the incumbent, I'm going to ask each of you three that are challenging to give me one example of where Governor Dewhurst has shown courage and effective leadership. And then when it comes back to you, Governor, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing for each of the three of them very quickly. So pick something that you're proud of that he did during his tenure as Lieutenant Governor so far. Start with you, Commissioner Staples. David Dewhurst is a good man. He has a big heart for children, and he, he's, I've seen him help them in many different circumstances, and I appreciate his caring for children. You know, David has made a consistent effort to reach out to Tejano voters, uh, which I intend to do as well. And I use the term Tejano, not Hispanic, they're Texans. Uh, he speaks Spanish. Uh, he has a good heart, and I'm proud of his effort to reach out to Tejano voters. I've said this before I was running for lieutenant governor in various events that we have gone to together, that uh, I thank him for helping me pass the sonogram bill. You know, we passed it out of the Senate at 7, it didn't pass the House. We passed it out at 9, it didn't pass the House. We passed it out at 11, and there were long nights, Governor, where you and I went through that bill line by line by line to make sure we had something working with the Attorney General that was constitutionally sound and would, withhold, uh, uh, would, would hold up against court challenges. So uh, the, uh, the sonogram bill, which will save 10 to 12,000 babies this year, uh, I appreciate you helping me get that done. I appreciate a number of things about all three. I've known all three of these gentlemen for a long time. The, um, and obviously it's the, it's the political season. But let me be very blunt. Uh, and I can pick a number of good things about each and every one of the three. But Senator Patrick and I worked hand in glove on it is a tough bill, tough situation with the being threatened by the Department of Justice. But on the anti-groping TSA bill, we worked together and we got that bill passed. And uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate your leadership. Um, <laughs> Senator Staples, um, rather Commissioner Staples, uh, I, I, to, to this day I feel kind of guilty about what I did to you. But there was, <laughs> in 2003, and it was tough. In 2003, it seems all my life I find myself in these battles, but 2003 we had a redistricting battle, and um, we ended up over the years adding nine more Republican seats from Texas to Congress. But the first start, the first start was I called Todd because one of our members was sick, and I called him on a Friday night in Palestine, and I said, Todd, and he said, Governor, how are you? And I said, fine, Todd, uh, can you do me a favor? He said, sure, you name it. I said, great, I'm putting you on the jurisprudence committee. You're going to handle um, the uh, redistricting bill. And can you be in Laredo, Texas tomorrow at 9 a.m.? <laughs> and I said, and he said, Governor, how am I going to do that? I said, look, I've done the heavy work. I've given you the idea. You handle the details. <laughs> Uh, Jerry Patterson, I can say a number of nice things about him. But Jerry really loves Texas. He loves uh, the land. He's done a fabulous job at the land office. And um, thank you for taking uh, such good care. Uh, you know, I care about veterans. You care about veterans. And thank you for doing such a good job to help care for our veterans. I promise we're not going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. That's not what I was headed for there, but uh, I, I, I did want to give you all a chance to do something like that. We're going to go to closing arguments. There's so much we wanted to cover, everything from Sharia law to toll roads and all kinds of things. I encourage everybody to go to their websites. They have detailed information on each of their websites, and you can study that there. Um, i tell you what, guys, since I kind of messed up the order a lot throughout that thing, let's do this. We're going to reward you for how, who's got the most rebuttal cards. How many rebuttal cards do you have left? How many you got down there, Todd? You got all four? No way. <laughs> we might be here a while, guys. Okay. So, three and a half. I got three and a half. Oh, yeah, we cut one of those in half, Todd. All right. So let's do this. Let's go Let's go. least number of rebuttals. Did you open? You, did you open or close? You open, so you should get the close. Okay. He's got, he's giving him a half. Okay. Let's start with Todd. You got the most rebuttals. 
And you get the longest go last. <laughs> you get the longest time, so you want to uh, hold their attention. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give two, two back to you all out there. How about that? <laughs> I'll just tell me. Yeah, That's right. You went last anyway, right? So you should go first this time. Anyway. All right, go ahead. Have you have two minutes, minutes anyway, so add your two minutes rebuttal. Yeah, I'll tell you one. Knowing that everybody's sleepy and wants to watch the World Series. <laughs> Thank you all for putting up with us tonight. And it's really what our country's all about. It's you, it's being engaged, it's talking about the issues. We really did get into how we're going to have and challenge our education system to, to, to produce great results and reward fabulous teachers in the classroom. We didn't get into how we're going to solve our transportation crisis as we move forward as a state. As Lieutenant Governor, I recognize you need a leader that is going to be focusing on the fundamentals. And that's why I'm running for Lieutenant Governor, because we have to make certain that government does what it's supposed to do and gets out of everybody else's business on these other areas. As Commissioner of Agriculture, I have worked to abolish agencies, move those functions to the Department of Agriculture, and we've delivered those services at lower cost and with fewer number of employees because that's what you expect conservatives to do, to govern, to provide efficient services and to look for ways to cut cost. I've given back millions, tens of millions of dollars back to you coming in under budget and on time. And if you think about the things that make Texas unique, I am going to hang on to them as your lieutenant governor. There are two constitutional provisions that makes Texas different, folks. One is, by constitution, we're only supposed to meet every other year. I want to keep it that way. Because keeping us government from meeting, they can't go spend your money. Keeping government having to plan on a two-year cycle is makes you be more frugal and more cost conscious. And I appreciate our Texas forefathers doing that. The second thing that makes Texas a good state is that we do have a balanced budget requirement. As Lieutenant Governor, I want to get other states, let's have a balanced budget requirement to the United States Constitution and rein in this insatiable appetite for spending. That's what we need to do. And we can use the way that we do business in Texas and the way that I've done as Commissioner of Agriculture, the way that we've had these savings is because I called in my department heads and we ask them questions on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, daily if we need to, to make sure that they're spending your dollars wisely. As Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to be calling in our agency heads on a regular basis. I'm going to make them come with the uh, appointments that serve on the boards and commissions. And we're going to be asking them two questions. One is, is what you're doing a legitimate state function? And if secondly, if the answer is yes, how can you deliver those services more efficiently? That's the way that we're going to grow taxes. That's the way that we're going to lower your property taxes. That's the way that we're going to cut out and eliminate our margins tax is by demanding those efficiencies in our government that you pay for every day, and I never forget that. I've got a minute left out of my six, but I'm only using four. It's good math. That hey, math works. I want you to know something about me that got two precepts that shape my philosophy when I'm making decisions for you, the taxpayers. One is this. I know that our rights come from God, not man. I know that it's the responsibility of each generation to protect and defend those rights. Our rights are enshrined in our Constitution. I wish patriotism was passed on genetically. We'd have the most patriotic country this world's ever seen. But it's up to us to teach this generation. The second thing that guides me is this. I know the bigger that government gets, the more effectively it encroaches on our rights. The bigger the government gets, it squeezes out families from fulfilling their role. The bigger the government gets, it squeezes out churches from fulfilling their role. The bigger that government gets, it squeezes out our free market economy from creating the jobs that gives us opportunity to prosper. So if you let me as your lieutenant governor, you're going to have someone that can take on the liberal element in Texas and say, Keeping government limited is not just a slogan. Keeping government limited is a formula for success. 
My website's ToddStables.com. I'd be honored if you voted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it's been a long evening, and I think you've concluded that the choice might be hard, but I'm telling you it's not hard. I'm the guy who picked me, all right? Let's start out with this help. Um, you need to have one of them good choice here. Uh, I'm going to ask you to consider a lot of things. And you're going to be confronted over the next six months with a lot of slogans, cliches, bumper stickers, all of that stuff. You're going to have somebody describe themselves. I'm the authentic conservative. I'm the consistent conservative. We have a tall conservative up here as well. I'm a not so tall conservative. But I want you to go beyond the slogans, the cliches, and the bumper stickers. And yes, go to the websites. Look on issues. Check specificity. See what we propose to do. Learn a little bit about us. And look for somebody who's going to go beyond the cliches. I submit to you that I'm, a, I'm that guy. I'm going to get specificity. That's what I'm going to talk about. I will also tell you that before the campaign is over, there's going to be something that you find that you do not agree with me or these other gentlemen on. There's going to be some issue you say, well, I just don't like that. But I will tell you, give you a little advice. If you want a candidate that you agree on with every single issue, you're going to have to run. You're going to have to be that candidate. We're Republicans, but we are not robots. You know, we haven't had a lobotomy to where we all agree together. And you also have to recognize that I'm a guy who realizes that most of us in this room here as Republicans, we're kind of done. You know, we're old. We're moved on. We've got it done. But what I will tell you is we're not in it for you and me. We're in it for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. Because people like me, like David, like Todd, like Dan, we're just passing through. Someday we'll be those pictures in the Capitol as you go up on each different floor. Nobody knows who the heck they are. We will be remembered not by our name, but by what we do or fail to do. I'd ask for your vote. Please vote Patterson.com. Vote for these other gentlemen. They're good men too, but pick me first. God bless you. God bless Texas. Thank you all for being here. You've been just a great audience. It's a great privilege to have the opportunity to run for this office. By the way, I'm going to give a minute back too, so it's just going to be four minutes and count me down. Um, good people, but there's a difference, and you're going to have to choose. Um, we talked about border security, and it's important to look at records. Um, Commissioner Staples voted to give illegals in state tuition. He voted to give them driver's license, and he voted to force hospitals to give illegals non-emergency care. Now, he may have a different position today, <laughs> but votes matter. I've cast over 16,000 votes. I filed Bill 10 sanctuary cities, and we did pass it. We did pass it in 2011 special session. Brian Birdwell and I are the only two senators who actually took action to repeal in-state tuition. We lost. But votes matter. Pass is a predictor. You can change your position on things, but we need to know who wants records. Um, I've been endorsed by great Christian leaders like James Dobson, formerly a focus on the family, and others around our country and in our state, pastors. I've been endorsed by grassroots leaders. We're up to over 200. We're getting ready to announce another 200 across the state. Not because I have the best smile, because I don't, or the best Texas accent, because I don't. I'm not even the tallest guy, and I usually am, and I'm not the funniest guy. But conservatives across Texas, Tea Party leaders and conservative Republicans all, have looked at my record of 16,000 votes. I said when I went to the Senate, I would fight to be the most conservative senator, and this session, Texas Conservative Coalition, once again, ranked me number one, even after four sessions. Uh, I have not caved in to becoming part of the establishment. Uh, I'm running for lieutenant governor because we have an agenda that we have not completed. I feel like I'm the most experienced member here in terms of I've been here four sessions. I know every bill that didn't pass and why it didn't pass. I know every vote we need to get. I know that I'm not going to put six out of 12 Democrats as chairman of committees. I'm going to let conservatives lead the Senate. And I will promise you, finally, we will pass 
a priority to secure our borders in Texas. We will end sanctuary cities. We will end in-state pollution. We will pass no choice. And so help me, I will reduce your property taxes. This is, I'm 63, I'm blessed. I'm not running for a long political career. If my wife allows me and you bless me with your vote the first time, if she allows me to run one more time, I'm a term limit two times, I'll be 71, I'll be out. I just want to get the job done. I worry about my children. I worry about my grandchildren. I have one, two are coming January, February. If you vote for me in March, we'll have a heck of a new year in the Patrick household to start the new year. I just want to get the job done. We can't lose Texas to the Democrats. If we lose Texas, we never elect a Republican president in our lifetime or ever because electoral votes of California and Texas and New York tied together and make it impossible. We need conservative leadership in Texas to lead this state and get the job done. And we need to reach out to the Hispanic and African American community, and I will, to change the way they think about us. We're a great people. We're a great state. We're the last hope, folks. And I don't want to put too much pressure on you. But it's people like you all around the state, and all of us go visit, and we see so many great people in Texas who share the Judeo-Christian ethic, who believe in our great conservative principles, and they're ready to go to work, and they're ready to win. And they're ready to draw the line so that we never lose this state. So thank you for being here. I ask you for consideration of your vote. DanPatrick.org is my website. And I can only tell you what I told the people who elected me in Senate District 7 a long time ago, it seems. And that is, um, I give you my word, I will show up every day and work as hard as I can and represent you and represent the state of Texas. Thank you very much. God bless you. I'm sure Todd would love to go again, but yeah, since I say two minutes there, no, 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 shot at the end when we're in debate time, he didn't do anything. I'll just use one of them. You already closed. Well, I did, but I had two minutes reserved, and then took a cheap shot. But we were going out the door here. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I'm out. sorry, I missed that. I didn't hear mention mention you. I will let you use your. You know, Dan. Dan wants to talk about the endorsements he's gotten. As a Christian, I think our first responsibility is to tell the truth. Tell me when a minute's up. His first ad in the campaign was a lie. It wasn't by me that just said that. It was by multiple.